So today, we're going to be going over how we plan on adding 200K a month, every month, in new recurring revenue, okay? Um, it's cool because I look back and uh, I just found a notebook in my desk drawer from uh, 2020, and one of our goals was get to 70K a month in total revenue. And here we are today, and we're closing that every single week, whereas that was our goal for our entire company for the entire year. Uh, and it's pretty cool to see how we progressed. Uh, but I want to forewarn you before I get into this presentation, I'm going to dump a lot of stuff at you guys, okay? The goal here is not to take everything that I'm telling you and try to go implement it, because it will not work, okay? You do not have 180 team members on your team to be able to run what I'm about to show you every single piece. What I ask of you is that you take one or two pieces from this presentation that you feel confident in executing in your business based on how your business is and going deep on those one or two things the rest of the year and running with them to get where you want to be. Is that cool with you guys? Is that cool with you guys? All right, bring that energy for an hour for me. This is going to be fucking great. Cool. So uh, this is a cool little Slack message we got the other day from Curtis, our head of partnerships. Uh, new two-week PR for the e-com squad in 11 days, 73K cash collected. This is just on the e-com side, not the local side. Uh, your boy Eddie Malouf threw up another 85 grand on top of this. Uh, so day, day 11, cash, cash, cash. None of these contract values. So we're about 160K, about 11 days into the month of new added recurring revenue, right? Uh, and we're going to try to keep this pace and push this pace for the rest of the year. I'm going to kind of walk you through it. But before we do that, we need to understand... Why? Why am I trying to add this much revenue, right? Because your answer and your why of doing so and your number that you need to reach is going to be a lot different than mine. So I'm going to walk you through kind of how we get there. So first thing we need to do is understand what that looks like. So to keep it simple, uh, basically what you're going to do is we're going to take the revenue that you're trying to get to for the year, right? So let's say uh, you're currently at 100K a month and you want to get to 200K a month, okay? That's going to be your goal, right? So we need to figure out what is that number that we're trying to get to. Then we're going to break down a projection backwards from that number to understand how much money we need to add every single month. So uh, to kind of break this down, let's say you guys have a 10% churn rate per month, okay? We're going to need to bake that in because I think a lot of times in the agency space, we make the misconception of like, how much money do I need to add from where I'm at to get to where I want to be? And the problem that we don't account for is how many clients am I going to lose along the way getting there? And we don't bake that in. And so what happens is we actually underestimate how much revenue we need to bring in in order to get to that goal because we're not baking in a fair number of churn, right? So for this sake of this example, we're going to go with a 10% churn. And we're going to pretend we have 200K a month of starting revenue, just to kind of show you how the math is going to break down. So uh, we're going to break it out per month and every month. This is a very simple spreadsheet that you guys can run. I'm going to put what my starting revenue is for the month, the first month of the year and what the final revenue that I want at the end of the year is gonna be. So in this case, it's $500,000 on the bottom right in December. On the top left, we have $200,000 to start the year, just an example. The second line is gonna be my 10% churn rate. That means every month, whatever my top line revenue that I'm starting at, I'm gonna take 10% of that and just lose it every month. And, and here's the thing, if your churn rate is 8%, I highly recommend that you put something bigger, like 10%, okay? Because a lot of times as we push pace, churn is going to increase, even if it's just by like 20%, 30%. It's bound to happen. We're not built to handle an operation two, three times as big that quickly, right? That's why most businesses are impressed by 20% growth per year. We're sitting here going crazy and trying to grow 100%, 200%. Things are going to break. Things are going to get worse. So let's account for them right out the gate. And then we're going to map out the rest of the year based on the minus 10% every single month. How much money do I need to make? in new sales to be able to compensate for the churn as well as the expected growth that I need so that I can eventually get to my number at the end of the year. Does this make sense? No? Okay. If you're an agency owner who's trying to take their business to the next level, you need to be at Agency Founders in January.
This is an event that we've been throwing on for the past four years at this point, where we get 207 and eight figure agency owners inside of a room together to collaborate for three days of high level events. We're talking seven, eight, nine figure speakers on stage sharing the most up to date strategies on hiring, sales, marketing, and everything in between to growing your agency, even selling your agency at the end of it all. Not only is this a room full of 200 agency owners, but this is the highest level of experience you can have. Every single year, we spent over half a million dollars just putting this event together so we can have the highest caliber food, highest caliber event, highest caliber networking, everything that you can think of. It is the highest level experience that you can get in the agency space. But not only that, it is the highest level of information with the highest level of people in the room. We vet every single person. No one is allowed to buy a ticket unless they run an agency. They've shown us proof of what they've done. And we don't let any other service providers in just because people sell to an agency and want to pay us for a ticket. Doesn't matter. They're not allowed in the event. We don't even take sponsors. So if you want to learn more about how to be in the right room at agency founders and secure your spot before they're gone because they've sold out every single year, then go ahead, click below inside of the description on this video. You're going to see theagencyfounders.com. You can go, you can learn more, you can see the location, you can see the dates, you can learn more about the ticket pricing based on when you're going to buy tickets get more expensive over time. So the sooner that you get in, the cheaper your ticket's going to be. Get your ass in the right room and I want to see you at agency founders in January. So on a quarterly basis, this is how we're gonna measure. I'm just gonna bulk things up in a quarterly and you'll start understanding my presentation why I look at it this way. But in our VIP session, I was telling everyone, I look at ads and marketing uh, and attention, which is gonna be a big topic today, as time in the market, not timing the market, okay? It's kinda like stocks at the end of the day. If I have a really good stock, I'm gonna bet on, I don't care if it goes down or up this week, as long as by the end of the year, by the end of the five year period, whatever it is that I'm working on, that number looks good. So in our business, we don't really measure ad spend on a monthly or on a weekly basis. We're gonna evaluate it on a quarterly basis because I might have a really good month like January and then a subpar month like February for different reasons, but as long as at the end of the quarter, my ad spend and my total revenue collected from that money is looking good, that is my priority because I know not everyone's ready to buy all the time, but as long as I'm always in front of them more than everyone else, when they are ready to buy, they're gonna to come to me first. So how the fuck are we actually gonna be able to do this, right? This is a big number. Most of you guys don't even comprehend 200K a month of new recurring revenue, right? And just two years ago, we were in the same situation. Our company would have doubled every single month uh, if we were doing anything close to this sort of numbers. So the goal seems impossible, but with attention and enough attention, just like Joel was talking about earlier, we can get enough eyeballs on what we're doing that it's just a matter of percentage points, right? If I can get 1% of everyone that sees me to buy something, I just need more people to see me so that 1% grows big enough to be $200,000. In our world, attention is the most valuable currency and the right attention is more important than the quantity of attention. I'll give you an example. My younger brother is a viral YouTuber. He gets millions of views per video. He can't ask his audience for more than $5 or they'll go bonkers. They can't even believe he's asking for money. I could have 10,000 views on a YouTube video and I could ask you guys to spend $5,000, $10,000 to be in this room and you will do it. You understand the difference here? I don't care about the quantity. I don't care about going viral. I care about the right people. My target addressable market, seeing my content and it being stuff that resonates with them so that they can purchase with me. So this year we're gonna be focused less on TikTok and those kind of platforms. We're gonna be focused more on professional platforms I'm gonna kinda of walk you through it. So we're gonna go through a few different strategies. Our YouTube organic strategy is the first one. Our Instagram organic strategy, LinkedIn and Twitter organic strategy, paid ads, outbound email marketing, and hosting events and dinners. This is a new one for us, uh, and it's going really well already. We're only a month into the year. So let's reorder these in how quickly I can automate or delegate these. I think this is important for you guys, right? Like we could sit here and talk about all the things I'm gonna to do to make a ton of money this year that you guys can use as well. But let's order them in the order that it takes for you guys to do it with ease. Starting with the easiest one at the top, which is LinkedIn, Twitter, organic. This is something that doesn't require your time. You could have someone else do it. I'm gonna kind of show you what we're doing on our end. Outbound IG email marketing. This also doesn't require your time. You can delegate this fully. Paid ads also doesn't require your time. You can do it once. That thing can run every single day. You just spend more money on it and it will keep making you money. And as we go down the list, YouTube organic, this starts taking up more of your time, right? The ROI of each one's gonna be different, but as we go down this list, 
your time is going to be more and more consumed. And so it's more realistic, in this case, for example, for you to even do number one, two, and three, even more than just number four by itself, because number four requires you showing up on a camera and actually delivering content and being strategic about it and thinking deeply about it. Whereas one, two, and three can be automated. You can have someone else doing that job for you and your face and your voice does not have to be on the camera. Instagram organic and events and dinners. So let's start with LinkedIn and Twitter organic. This is kind of what our current LinkedIn strategy is. I'm sure a lot of you guys are the same. And uh, it's Eddie makes a video for Instagram. That has nothing to do with LinkedIn. And then uh, I tell my team, hey, when you post it on Instagram, make sure you also post it on LinkedIn. Super thoughtless strategy, right? Very low effort, we're not doing a lot of things on there, and guess what? It's not generating us a lot of business for that same reason. And so I thought to myself, I said, listen, how can I not be the guy who has to sell everything in the company? How can I create multiple versions of Eddie that can sell for the company without it having to be me? Can I take up five times as much space on the internet by having five other people, not me, doing content distribution across the internet? So essentially what we're switching our strategy to is gonna be something like this, where we're gonna take subject matter experts inside of our company, whether that's email marketing, whether that's ads, whether that's Google, Facebook, info products, e-commerce stores, every single category that we have, and we're gonna basically build their Twitter and LinkedIn followings organically through ghost copywriters inside of our company. So no longer am I going to be dependent on Eddie Malouf to generate deals for the company on these platforms. I'm going to build my team's brand so big on these platforms in their categories that I will be able to scale that up without their time or my time by basically having them meet with a copywriter and distributing that content through that person. So eventually it's gonna look like this, where a copywriter is essentially gonna have all the information from all these people. There's gonna be an e-com subject matter expert. There's gonna be an email subject matter expert, a conversion rate optimization, an Amazon one, Eddie, Ashton, et cetera. And as we do this, we can start scaling this up more and more and more. And uh, I think yesterday we were talking about this and um, someone was like, do you think I should do like, all three of these things at the same time, or do you think I should just do this one thing at the same time? Uh, and my theory has always been like, I think it takes marginal amount of effort to do all five of these as it does to do like one, right? If the system's already in place and I have a process for what this looks like, I've done the hard work. At this point, I can start plugging and playing different people into this. So a few ways that we're pulling this content just to kind of keep this easy for you guys. We're doing bi-weekly meetings with these subject matter experts and the copywriters to go over things that have happened, case studies at work, uh, different strategies that they're implementing. So I'll take email marketing, for example. We'd be talking about a really sick pop-up idea that we implemented on a business and what that came out to be, right? Uh, we implemented a new automation in a business for email marketing and it doubled the revenue from the automation with this one change. So finding things that we're actively doing in the business uh, to do so. We're also taking AI and using that to be able to spin up a lot more content instead of just depending on this copywriter to bang out hundreds of tweets uh, and LinkedIn posts every single week. And uh, who here has a dubs channel? Can you guys put your hands up, like a wins channel in your company? All right, cool, about half of you. The other half needs to implement that ASAP. This is one of the best things in the culture of the company, but it's also a huge reinforcement for the sales team because we have a channel where all our wins go in, right? And we encourage our team to do so very, very frequently. And when you do that, what happens is there's this disconnect between your sales team, your marketing team, and your fulfillment team, okay? They don't talk every single day. They don't necessarily know all the cool things that we're doing for clients. And so when we have a dubs channel or a wins channel, we allow our team to publicly display and showcase the wins that they're getting for clients, which then empowers not only everyone else on the team, but your sales and marketing team with ammo when they're going and talking to new clients. And so... Us doing more of this inside of our company will only allow us to have more content to display publicly into the world. The problem that we're doing right now is we have 100 dubs every month that go on this channel, and guess what? We're not going and posting them as a case study. We're not posting them on LinkedIn. We're not posting them on Twitter. We're holding them internally for ourselves. So this year, we're gonna start distributing those more often. So essentially, we're gonna be posting three to five times a week uh, on LinkedIn. We're gonna be requesting connections to decision makers. We've already used you know, list scraping softwares to pull this information. Uh, but basically we're taking all the decision makers in these companies that we're trying to work with 
And instead of sitting here and DMing them on LinkedIn and sending them some stupid cold DM like everyone else is doing, I get 100 of those a day, uh, what we're doing is we're gonna strategically build this over time. So we're gonna build our audience organically and then we're gonna push the content that's gonna be valuable to them over time. I don't need this to make me an ROI tomorrow, but if by the end of the year, each one of my subject matter experts can bring me one more deal a month, not two, not three, just one more deal a month, I now have six more huge deals coming in without my face, without my name, without my time, without my effort, and over time that only compiles and adds up, right? So. Next strategy is gonna be our outbound IG slash email marketing. This one's like the most simple. Uh, I know a lot of people here do cold email, like seriously, seriously. They get thousands of leads every single day. They're pushing email as hard as they can. Uh, and they're trying to just get quantity, quantity, quantity. And so I think this for us is the year of stepping away from bulk quantity and trying to be very specific with who we wanna talk to, right? I'm not trying to date everyone. I just want the specific people that I wanna talk to. So. Uh, with that being said, we want to make this more personalized. We, we don't want to make it automated. Essentially, we aren't going after a huge market of people, right? I can't sign up 100 e-com stores a month. It's like impossible. We're, we would die tomorrow. So what I need to focus on is how can I get the five that I want every single month? And so instead of sitting here and going and bulk putting people into a spreadsheet and finding some you know number that I can put and make it sound personalized to them, we're actually going in and doing research on those people's lives. Did they have a kid recently? Did they have an achievement in their company? What are things that we could pull out that we could send in an email and congratulate them on? If someone just had a kid recently and the subject line of the email sending them is, congratulations on your daughter Ava, example, right? That's a subject line that's worth opening to that person because it's very specific and personal about their life versus the rest of you guys are saying, do you want a 2X your return on ads, question mark? And every single person looks the same, right? And so this year, we are spending more time being personalized on these, and I really challenge you guys to do the same. Uh, we're using reply.io to send them currently, uh, but I believe we'll be moving towards Gmail uh, just because I don't need to send thousands a day. If I send 50 really good emails a day with a VA, I can get the job done, I think, a lot more effectively, right? My sales team can't handle a ton of conversations, and quite frankly, I would bet that if someone is sending 1,000 cold emails, at a time that aren't personalized, and I'm only sending 50, I would bet that I would have way more responses as a net number uh, than they would. Now, I'm not even talking percentages, I'm talking I would probably have 20 out of 50, and they might have like three out of 1,000. So uh, this is a strategy that we're taking, and I challenge you guys in your business to kind of step outside of the walls of like this automation, lazy, how can we do as much with as little as possible, and maybe applying a little bit more effort. A VA overseas might cost you only 800 bucks, $1,000 a month to run this whole thing for you, but the results that you would generate might be exponential compared to you just sitting here and putting them in a $100 software uh, and spending all that time. And last but not least, we're leveraging a software called OpenSend to collect emails of visitors, and then we're cold emailing based on their, if they're qualified. Has anyone heard of like Zoom Info? Yeah, okay, a couple people in the room. So Zoom Info, basically what it does is if someone visits your website, and uh, they don't like do anything, you can see who's visiting your website, right? But you can't really see the person, you'll see the company. So it'll be like someone from Microsoft visited your company, might be one of these people, right? Uh, and you paid $20,000 plus a year for that software and you have to pay it up front. It's super expensive, it's a huge risk of an investment. Uh, so we needed an alternative, right? So uh, we started using OpenSend and so now for example like Last week, someone from um, Dean Graziosi and Tony Robbins' company visited our website. I would not have known that this person visited the website a few months ago, but because OpenSend is on my website, my sales team can go through and see all the people that are visiting our website without giving us their information. And so we can handpick based on the company, based on the person, we have their social media profiles, we have their email, we can reach out to these people manually based on who we actually wanna talk to. Right, and actually uh, the founder of uh, OpenSend, Francesco, you, you could stand up. If you guys wanna talk to him, uh, he, he said he'll hook you guys up with uh, OpenSend for free as long as you guys can uh, get a referral of one of your clients to go to OpenSend, so go talk to him with that. Uh, you could save $20,000 instead of paying Zoom info for this uh, pretty high tech information uh, and just getting it with him. So guys, meet with him afterwards and uh, set that up if you guys can, but we are huge affiliates of OpenSend. All our clients are on OpenSend. Um, and we're making a huge push this year to get them on there because the ROI is huge. So use this for your business as well. Uh, you can garner 
a lot of data because we're sitting here spending money on ads, we're doing organic, we're doing emails, we're doing all these strategies, we're spending so much money and time and only a small percentage point of people actually give us their contact info, right? All these other people are just shopping quietly. And if I can figure out who's shopping quietly and hand pick them, not only do I have the advantage that I can reach out to them, but they're also kind of impressed. They're like, how the fuck did you get my information? You know what I mean? And when you're going to hire a marketing company, you look for creative strategies like this that allow you to have a competitive advantage on your opponents. So uh, Instagram will also be manual. So we're already starting this. Uh, what we used to do is like, hey team, setters, get in Eddie's inbox and the bad marketing inbox. And uh, every day you're gonna message 25 brands. And this is the template message that you're gonna send. And we, we started doing it that way, right? And over time we might get one out of I don't know, 80 to 100 people actually responding positively to us, setting up a call, and it was a very daunting process. Uh, and most importantly, it didn't represent the brand that we wanted, right? We wanna be premium. That's why we spend so much money on this AV setup, on all the food that we have, on this event, to make it high and premium. That is the brand that we want at BAD. And so this doesn't represent us uh, the way that we want to. So what we started doing is just hand-picking people and manually reaching out to them. So I'll give you an example. The other day, uh, Michael Jordan, our partner on the Amazon side, he was like, hey man, there's this brand that's, uh, they're not on Amazon, but their site has 800,000 visitors on their Shopify store every single month. This would be a huge brand to go and actually get on Amazon. I think we can make them like $10 million plus this year. And so what I did, again, manual, instead of sitting here and like add them to the bulk list, send them an email and see if the team can get in touch, I went in, I did some research, I went on their profiles, they recently had a kid looking at their family. Guess what? Out of all the platforms, everyone follows them the most on LinkedIn, so I'm not gonna message them there. I go to their Instagram. The founders each, they're, they're a husband and wife. They each have 250 followers. I, I have 90,000 followers. I have a very good reputation. I have all these huge people following me on Instagram. I have leverage there. So I went and DM'd them on Instagram, and that started a conversation for us to take over their Amazon. That could be a six-figure a year deal for our company, and all it took was me spending about three minutes doing some actual research on who I'm trying to talk to and trying to actually care about that relationship as opposed to just shotgunning everyone and seeing who responds. Does that make sense? Cool. So you're gonna see a lot more leverage when, when other people that are mutuals are responding to you. If you can kind of understand what Cody was saying earlier, a big part of why we got along was we had so many mutual friends. And the coolest part about these platforms is the bigger you get, the more mutuals you're gonna have with other people. And those mutuals automatically pass the trust on to you, right? If they follow someone that they really like or they know personally, and that person happens to follow you too, automatically you're in the door, you have that trust and leverage. And if anything, you might even have a testimonial because they'll reach out to them and ask, hey, what do you know about this Eddie guy? And they'll say, oh, Eddie's legit. Like, I, I love Eddie, we talk all the time. Uh, also, pin posts are everything. And I'll get into this more on the ad side. Uh, but on your company page as well as your personal page. I always split test my pin posts. So like I took my Lambo down for a week and I noticed like my uh, people who are visiting my profile to the percentage that ended up following me went down. And I put my Lambo back up. And then uh, I, I did like a parody video, I don't know if you guys saw it, of like a million subscribers on YouTube. Uh, my brother got a million subs and I basically carried his plaque and shot like a fake guru video. Uh, pin that to the top, all of a sudden my percentage of people who visited my profile that actually ended up following me went up as well, right? Uh, and so we started doing the same on the bad marketing side. I used to think like authority is good, I need like all these pin posts on speeches. But as I started split testing and figuring out which pin posts actually attracted the people I wanted to talk to, I started playing around with it and then identifying what they cared about. So now my pin posts are, uh, I bought a chicken franchise, million subs on YouTube, blue Lamborghini. That seems to be the combo that's working the best right now for me. On our bad marketing page, it's a video about the merger. It's a video about a testimonial from Ramosi telling us how awesome we are. And so when people get on a sales call with Curtis, and for those that were in our VIP session, uh, you know Curtis was saying we have over 90% show rate on our calls. Uh, I don't think anyone has over 90% show rate from ads, right, not organic. They come on, and the first thing they say, oh, I saw your pin post, I love the merger. Oh, I know Ramosi too, like super excited to chat. Automatic credibility, right? They're not even gonna go through the entire account unless those three posts are awesome. So don't, don't, don't sleep on this, please. It sounds so simple, but I can't count how many people I go on their profiles. They have one pin post, they have no pin post. 
They don't take it seriously. Your pin posts are literally like the top fold of a website. And if you're not treating them like a top fold of a website that you would for a client or for your business, you're missing out on a lot of revenue. So here's kind of just the example so you can get a perspective there. That's mine on the bottom right. That's bads on the, on the left side. Um, and just kind of focus on that a little bit more. So let's get into paid ads. Who here is uh, running paid ads to, to get clients in their agency? Nice, good shit. I think more than half the room. So what we used to do is we used to run paid ads to like, really shit click funnels pages, okay? We'd go and just spin up a page as quickly as possible and we're like, hey, I have a really good offer. Uh, I'm gonna run free content if you run ads with us. Uh, team, get this going, I need it by 30 minutes from now, go. And then I'll go into the ad account, I'll build some ads, and then team will get the page ready and I'll run it, right? And it'll do well and I'll like put some lipstick on it and just keep running it, right? Um, and as we noticed over time, we might get a good brand here and there. But as I noticed over time, higher quality web pages actually got us way more qualified clients. It wasn't about the offer, it was about the brand. And so we started noticing bigger brands, and this is a common question a lot of you guys are asking me, is like, how do I get bigger brands? How do I get bigger clients? Bigger brands care about brands, and smaller brands care about offers. We've, we've learned this over the last year, right? The smaller the brand, the more they care about what it is, the one-time thing that you're presenting to them, what kind of deal are you gonna give them? Because you know what, that's, that's how these guys operate. They're like, if I can save money on content and do ads with these guys, that's what I care about. Whereas the bigger fish, they wanna know that you're about your brand as much as they want you to be about their brand. And so now, if you go to any of our landing pages, they all look like our website. You can't even tell the difference. You wouldn't know you're on a landing page versus a website. They're all themed the same, the headers all look the same, the buttons all look the same, the text all looks the same. There, there's absolutely no difference. You could be on 15 different landing pages for 15 different offers in our company and you would still think you're on the actual website of the company. You just can't tell the difference. And automatically, we've been pulling in way bigger fish from these ads. And I don't even need to run offers anymore, I just need to run the ads to these pages. But uh, in today's world, you, you need both to win, right? So. You need offers and you need to make the pages feel like they're actually a part of the brand that you're trying to sell people on, right? I'm not gonna give you responsibility of my brand if you can't even make your own brand look uniform and cohesive internally to your own company that you personally own, right? How can I trust you to do the same for my brand? Uh, and last but not least, we're basically running an evergreen campaign to our homepage. So every single month, no matter what, it could be the worst month in history, we could be losing hundreds of thousands of dollars we spend about 20 grand a month just to our homepage on the website, right? And it's back to bigger brands want brand. They don't want offers, right? Number one. And number two, it's time in the market, not timing the market. I know just because we have a bad month, it doesn't mean that there's not a buyer pool that wants to buy our stuff. It might just mean it's not now. It might mean they just got into a contract with another agency. It might mean that it's not a good fit right now because of their budget, but in two months, they'll be in a good fit. And I don't wanna miss on that opportunity because I know the rest of my competition, what they're doing is they're pausing ads. They're scared. They're getting cold feet. And when that happens, what does that mean? That means I can step in. I can take way more of their market share because they're backing out and I'm stepping in. And so we never, ever, 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 ever turn off ads. We only try to optimize them. So here's kind of a, I guess, a perspective of like an old page on the left versus the same page on the right. Uh, this is the same exact offer. There's no difference in the page. The copy is practically the same. But look at the difference in theming, in coloring, in text, how we, how we do it. The left page was just like a click funnels page that we just spun up for this offer. On the right, it's bad. This is bad marketing. Like this is exactly who we are. This is our color scheme. These are our fonts. This is, this is how we rock. And so every time they see an ad from me, no matter what the offer is, no matter what the ad creative is, if they're in Zimbabwe, if they're in South Africa, if they're in the US, they know it's a bad marketing page as soon as they get on it. And so as I spend more and more and more money on paid ads over time, they'll recognize me. And I know what a lot of you guys are doing because we've done the same thing for years. You spin up a ClickFunnels funnel or you put a job form on an application page and you run traffic to it and you have a really sexy marketing headline with a subdomain that says, you know, uh, connect.marketingagencyname.com and, and we all do the same thing because we spin it up and it's easy and it's quick and we can get leads. But what does that do? 
That means the next day you have to rebuild brand every time because every time you build a new page, every time you run a new ad, every time you spend another dollar, you're still rebuilding brand from scratch because you have no identity like this. And the more you build the identity the same across all the pages and you own your identity, the cheaper your ads get over time because they might see six, seven offers from you. They won't remember your company name is the reality, but they'll remember how this page feels and looks every time. They'll be like, I've seen this somewhere else. I've seen this somewhere else. And over time, you gain that familiarity with the marketplace and therefore you don't have to keep earning that media over and over again. Over time, that media will come back to you. So this is kind of how our funnels are broken down uh, in a rough sketch on my iPad, just so you have an idea of kind of how we're running things. So we have the 15, 20 grand a month that's going to our homepage, right? That's every month guaranteed, honestly, some of our best leads, right? Um, but what we also have is a funnel for every single offer or department that we have in the company, right? So in this example, we have a content offer, an email offer, an Amazon-based offer, a CRO offer, and then the homepage ads, right? And so based on the month and based on our capacity as a team, I'm able to determine where I can pull these levers on or off to generate more clients, right? And over time, over the last few years of building new offers and funnels every month, we're not just like deleting these things from our account, right? They're always there. The ads are always ready. The funnel's always ready. The automation's already plugged in on the back. And whenever I want, I can toggle them in the ad account. So if my team comes to me today and says, Eddie, we are overloaded on content. We cannot take any more content clients to run ads for. Please, please, please pause the content ads. I can go pause the content ads and go and find out, hey, email team, do you guys have availability? And they say, yeah, dude, we got, we got availability for four or five clients. Perfect. Let me put more budget into my email offer and run that until they tell me the same message back. And so instead of sitting here and depending on one offer that I'm putting all my eggs on one basket in, I'm able to move across the board and pick and choose based on the marketplace, based on how many of you guys come in, copy my offer, I turn it off, I go quiet, I go build another one, turn it on, and then you guys are done running it, and then I go turn it back on, right? So uh, this is very interesting. Another thing I think that a lot of you guys are not doing is uh, shooting new ad concepts once per month and always actually pre-planning the next offers, right? I was talking uh, to a couple guys yesterday, real estate investing coaching. Where are you guys at? You know who you are. Are you in here? Where are you at? Twin boys. There you go. They're, they, they're convincing me they're not twins, but they're definitely twins. Um, so I was talking to them yesterday, and I was like, they're like, hey, we're struggling. We, we can't scale past like, a, we're making 150K a month. I want to get to the next level. I can't. What do you think we should do? And we started brainstorming a bunch of ideas, and I was like, how many ads have you guys actually shot the last two months? And he was like, oh, I've shot seven like yesterday. I was like, no, no, no. You, it's impossible that you shot seven ads yesterday. You might have shot seven selfie videos of you talking to a camera saying, if you invest in real estate, you should take our course. But how many actual ads did you premeditate, did you plan, did you do to be able to generate more business? And they said, if that's what you're asking us, we've done zero in the last two months, right? And uh, Jared, you guys, you did that ambulance ad for real estate and the singing rap ad. How well did those do for you? Crushed it, right? So how much effort did it take to make that one ad? Fly out to Missouri, planned out, took an entire month to shoot this one ad, okay? But what does that do? Every single person that he's competing against in the realtor market can't compete with that. What they can compete with is sitting on a mic in their bedroom and shooting a selfie ad, okay? All of us can compete with that. Standing in front of a house and shooting an ad. You now allow everyone in your market to compete with you. But when you put in that extra effort, it's that extra step that 99.9% .9 of people are not willing to take. When you put that kind of effort in, it generates results that 99.9% .9 of people cannot get because they cannot take that extra effort. And so I challenge you this year, instead of sitting here and just trying to scrap your way to some ads and let's try to make them a little bit better and shoot some selfie videos, I challenge you guys to premeditate and plan. How can I be clever? How can I be witty? What do I want my brand to stand for and putting that kind of effort. It's one thing to do that effort for your clients. You have 100 clients, you can't do that. But you only have one of you. There's only one of your business. And so I challenge you this year to try to do that. Like I'm saying, it's about time in the market and uh, not every month or week is gonna be great. 
Uh, but for us, we don't care. We keep running the ads. We know it's going to be good. We know we're targeting the right people. And as long as we're targeting the right people with high quality ads and clever creatives, uh, we're going to be able to see the results come into fruition. And again, pin post, super important. We've noticed most people go ad profile, look at the pin post, and then they make a decision. And on Instagram, for example, when you're running an ad uh, and someone clicks on your profile from the ad, the button for the ad stays floating on the screen the whole time. So they're scrolling through your profile and it still says like apply now or learn more at the bottom, they can click it. So very, very easy transition. Uh, definitely, uh, I, I've, I've been tracking this. To be fair, uh, when we change our name to bad marketing, the amount of people that clicked on the profile went significantly up, right? Versus having like four media or he man, it's kind of like, I don't know what these guys are. Bad marketing creates a little bit more curiosity. People are clicking on our profile instead of going to the website to see what we're about. We live up to the hype, uh, and then they go and click that. So uh, is this helpful so far? You guys getting some value? Yeah? Half the room, cool. Uh, cool, YouTube organic. Can you stand up if you watch my YouTube videos? Stand up. All right, look around. 70% of the room watches my YouTube. Thank you so much, guys. You can sit down. I want to show you the power of YouTube. Because if I asked you how many people only watch my Instagram and don't watch my YouTube, this room would be a quarter of the size that it is today. Okay? But because we made an effort this year to start growing our YouTube, we're able to have so much more reach and so much deeper reach, right? I bet a lot of you guys have seen hours of content on YouTube. It would take you a hundred of my posts on Instagram to get to one single hour. But it takes one YouTube video to get you to two hours. So the principle here is different, and this year we're gonna be focused a lot more on YouTube organic. So we're actually splitting up into four different channels is how we're focusing. So I'm gonna have my Eddie Malouf channel, uh, just so you know kind of how our brain's working here. Eddie Malouf's gonna be just like my personal brand. I'm gonna be posting all kinds of content. I'll walk you through exactly the strategy of each one. We're gonna have Eddie's agency content. That's where I'm strictly posting videos for marketing agency owners. I decided after a conversation with Joel that I think if I'm gonna build this right, I wanna have a channel just for agency owners where I just deliver high level, agency level information that only relates to people in the agency space and separating that off uh, from my main channel. We're gonna have Ashton's channel uh, and then we're gonna have the bad marketing channel which we're gonna be building very aggressively this year. So what are we posting for each one? For my YouTube, I'm gonna go this, through this pretty quick so you don't get bored. I'm gonna post like vlogging work stuff, finance, marketing topics, speeches or online trainings. This is killer, by the way. Uh, if you guys wanna do something like this and you're not getting invited to speeches, I'd highly recommend you just post up in your office somewhere and, pre and shoot yourself pretending like you're talking to an office of people, but you're just shooting yourself, right? And it gives that authority effect, I'm serious, it gives that authority effect of you actually talking to other people. So you can kind of write your own video in a way and position it as a talk inside of an intimate room. Uh, and I think you'll get the same net result. We're testing this out right now uh, and lifestyle content as well. On the bad YouTube, we're gonna be going podcast heavy, a lot of what Joel's talking about, training and education topics, uh, fun fact, uh, this is actually on the Instagram page, but in December, we posted three reels uh, from our Amazon team. We posted three reels about Amazon educational stuff. Like if, you're, if you have an Amazon store, you should do X, Y, Z. This is like three tricks to do this on Amazon. We got four clients on Amazon who are paying us very well from those three organic posted videos. So educational content is huge. I think this year more than ever, there's a lot of noise and I think the more defined you are on the actual value that you can provide people on this content, the more people will wanna work with you, right? Trend analysis, this is a huge one. We can piggyback of other search volume that exists. Example, how did Andrew Tate, how did Andrew Tate get so famous? Making a video about that. People are already searching for Andrew Tate. We can look at the keyword volume on Google and YouTube and understand where are these trends and be able to make a video within 24 to 48 hours about them and analyzing them from a marketing angle uh, so that we can pull the viewership uh, of these people and then click or scroll. Uh, Ashton's YouTube is gonna be marketing content heavy, advertising content heavy. There's gonna be some leadership stuff in there. Case studies of clients, judging other people's ad campaigns. So as you can tell, I'm gonna be more broad business, more lifestyle. Ashton's gonna be very like marketing performance, leadership driven, right? We're trying to split it up so that I'm not sitting here and doing everything. We can get a little bit more defined as long as we're both doing it at the same time. We'll have no problem. Uh, could you guys play this video? 
away from Brazil. He's actually one of our employees here at Bad Marketing, an absolute legend at content creating, Victor Moreira. From meeting Victor to what he does for the company now, it's been an absolute honor to bring him and seeing him grow in his profession. I feel like what Victor brings to the table could be very valuable to you who owns an agency or you have creatives in your agency. He had a lot of great things to say on this. Cool. That wasn't me. I never filmed this. I never shot this. I never said this. This is 100% AI. I never once said any of these words. And the coolest part is, this is our beta video. The, the, the new video, I couldn't get in time. Uh, we reshot a bunch of stuff the other day to polish it, to fix like the way I blink so that it matches the way I actually blink, little things like that. Uh, but I didn't have to do any of this. And so I guarantee you, some point this year, I'm gonna be posting YouTube content that will never be shot by me, never be said by me. My team will just take things that I've said on calls or internal things in our organization, pull that content. They have my voice saved, my face saved, all my shirts saved, my different watches saved, all my, all my little gestures, the way I look, the way I blink, the way I laugh, all those things are saved. And over time, you will not recognize anymore if it's me making them or someone else. And so this allows me to go from one YouTube video a week to one a day if I want to, right? With no effort, very, very little time from me, virtually zero, and all it took was a lot of really cool setup. If you guys want the software that's doing this, it's called Hey Gen, H-E-Y-G-E-N, really cool software. Took us like one hour to figure it out, and we were, we were crushing it. I actually fooled my team on a company call and like played a video that actually had some context, uh, and then at the end I told them this was all a lie, and you know, it was, and none of it was me, and everyone was like blown away. So a uh, really, really cool technology that we're getting into here that'll allow you to leverage your time to make more content uh, so that that content can go and make money for you without your effort. So uh, Instagram organic, this is, this is a huge play for us. I can already tell this is gonna be like by far the biggest year on Instagram organic for us. We got three focuses. We got my brand, Ashton's brand, and Bad Marketing's brand. Ironically, the biggest focus of the three is actually the Bad Marketing brand this year. Whereas the themes up to this point were the Eddie brand, okay? Uh, the bad marketing brand is the one we're gonna be focused on the most. So we're gonna be focused on quality, not quantity. Uh, I would rather have 30,000 views of people who are interested in marketing than a million view video about some viral topic that I made just to go viral, right? In Joel's case, he was talking earlier, his goal is to go viral, right? He wants to target broad market. He'll talk to anyone as long as they're willing to wanna invest into starting a marketing agency. They could be 14 years old, they could be 40 years old, it doesn't matter, right? My market is very specific. I have to talk to a business owner who's doing at least a few million dollars a year in the e-commerce or info product space. I'm trying to attract a certain crowd, so I don't need everyone, right? So for the bad account, we're trying to get as much reach as possible. For my personal account, I'm trying to define that reach a little bit better, I'll show you why. So on my short form, just to keep it quick, Vlogging, work stuff, finance topics, speeches. I cut my speeches up into clips. As you guys can tell when we're doing breakout sessions, I'm always mic'd up. I probably got enough content from this conference alone to last me the rest of the year, right? I probably never have to actually shoot another, another piece of short form this entire year, never step into a studio. I'll have that content, I'll never have to do it again. So try your best to do so. A lot of you guys are running team meetings, uh, in person, online, whatever it is. You're not recording yourself with a third party camera. That's all content. There are so many times you guys just drop like two, three, four really good sentences to your team that just go forgotten forever. You'll never be able to use it again. And you've only used it on 15 people that you're talking to. But if that was recorded, you could use it on 15,000 people with the same amount of effort that, you, that you're already doing. So I really challenge you guys to do so. We underestimate a lot of times how intelligent we are, right? We think that the things that we know and the things that we say are very common. But in reality, outside of this room, they are not common, guys. People don't just go and make millions of dollars a year. It's not a normal thing to a lot of people, right? They have problems that you guys have the answers to that you're neglecting and you have a, a false belief that you can't help these people, you can't deliver them value and the things that you're saying aren't that valuable because you're comparing yourself to all these other peers who are making millions of dollars a month and so you feel inadequate because of that. So I challenge you to record yourself more, to put that content out more. It doesn't need to be you sitting there and talking to a camera. You could be doing the normal things you're doing, talking to your team, mentoring your team, giving them coaching on certain subjects. Just record yourself off on the side, put a mic, put your phone, and watch what you can do the next year. You can change so many lives, guys. So uh, I think that's something that's super important, personal advice, interview type content from other successful people. If you notice this is a theme, Joel's talking about this on podcasts. 
Some of my best performing clips are just going up with a mic and asking someone what they do for a living, how much money they make, and any advice they have for someone to get into that career. Super simple, but now I'm leveraging someone else's expertise, someone else's revenue that they're doing, and being able to use that to get viral. All those clips had over 100,000 views when I filmed them. I just went to car shows. I was like, hey man, how do you afford a car like this? What is it? Oh, it's a Euros, $500,000. What do you do to do that? Boom, boom, boom. Very quick, and I'm leveraging that content, right? So be very aware, always have a mic in your pocket. That's what I do, I put a mic in my backpack, uh, just in case I need to plug it in. Bad shorts, so this is where like, we're hiring three editors right now just to go deep into this. Uh, I've, I've never been so confident in a strategy for organic marketing as I have in this. Uh, so number one, bad or bad. Uh, unfortunately, they're both capitalized here, but on a Instagram a post, it would be uppercase bad or lowercase bad. So this is a huge theme that we're doing this here. You'll see us posting this all the time on the channel. We're gonna leverage, and here's what you're gonna notice out of this theme. How much can I leverage from things that are already happening in the world and other people are doing to get as many views for our brand as possible. So bad or bad, we're gonna take other ads, whether it's Geico, Super Bowl ads, whatever it is from the past, right? We can take infinite amounts of content, post it, and ask people, is this a bad ad or a bad ad, right? And start letting people go off in the comments with each other. And so I can piggyback off all the sick ads or the shit ads that everyone's made in the past and start conversations about it. Those are things that people share with each other in Instagram DMs between each other. I can piggyback off that virality. And so many people don't even know about a lot of these ads. Ads from 10 years ago that were absolutely hilarious or absolute flops and disasters. And being able to put these online, not have them show up on my feed, but only show up on my reels, uh, we're gonna be able to generate so much traffic from that. Uh, BTS of product shoots, that's pretty easy. Case study videos, like I told you about, we're already doing stuff like this. Uh, and it's actually generating us clients that don't follow us, just absolute cold marketing because we're delivering so much value. Uh, educational segments, uh, that's more of the Amazon stuff. Uh, before and after product shots, raw stuff, before and after, blah, blah, blah. I'll tell you what the coolest part is. Trends that are hot that we can jump on, okay? Uh, again, like the bad or bad thing. How can I take what's happening in the world and piggyback off that attention and let's call it momentum around that topic and do it for ourselves, right? Uh, so Barbie versus Oppenheimer. We missed the ball on this one. We did it like six weeks after it was in theaters uh, and the video didn't do as well as we wanted to, right? It's because there's some internal delays. We lacked focus and we didn't get it done. If I got this, the video that we did on that done within the first week of launch, I guarantee it's a million plus view video, right? And so I gave the team this concept. I said, listen, every single week moving forward, we're gonna find a trend like this that we can jump on, right? Next day, team came back, sent me a full video already done. I was like, what is this? They're like, first trend video, done. I opened it up, it was um, those, uh, the bottles with, Star what are they called, the Stanley Cups? The pink Stanley Cups with Starbucks, this huge campaign that they did. This girl's car caught on fire, but the cup never, never melted and the cup still had ice in it. And it was this huge trend that was going viral everywhere. So the team piggybacked off it and said, let's do a voiceover and let's talk about it as if like someone cold who has no idea what's happening would watch it. Uh, last week this car burned down and uh, this might be the greatest campaign ever by Starbucks, blah, blah, blah. You guys can watch it on our page. But like, let's just compare the view count on that video. So first attempt, first shot, no revisions, nothing. 30 grand right out the gate. If you look at all our other videos, five grand, six grand, five grand, five grand. The cool part is that 30 grand, like 80% of it was new people who have never followed us or seen us before, right? And so this year we're going super hard on just finding other news in our space and other trends and other people's marketing and ads that we can piggyback off of. Instead of creating new content, we can just talk about the stuff that people already wanna know about and already interesting to them and we'll be able to piggyback off that view count. So uh, this year we have some pretty audacious goals on our following on Instagram, but I believe, uh, I think right now we only have like 16 or 17,000 followers. Uh, I have no doubt that by the end of the year we'll have over 100,000 followers on our Instagram. All people who are prospects or potential referrals because I'm gonna piggyback off of trends that are happening in the marketplace. I used to sit there, I know you guys do the same, I used to sit there and try to think of every possible thing we could do. Maybe we could do a short form, a video on this and let's talk about mindset and let's talk about this and then they just all flop, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking too hard. Whereas, why don't I just look at what's in front of me and find what people are already interested in and just take advantage of it. Was that helpful? Yeah. Cool, cool. Events and dinners. So this is, uh, this is uh, the last one that we're doing here. 
this is pretty cool. We started playing around with this a little bit last year. Uh, but basically, like, uh, we travel for conferences, for work, for a bunch of other things, right? Uh, so I decided, I was like, you know, if I'm already going to these main cities, why don't I start doing some reach out and try to find out who are the big players in these cities and get them all in a room together for dinner. And I'll just cover dinner. I'll take them to the nicest restaurant. I'm not going to take them to McDonald's. You know, I'm going to take them to a really nice restaurant, probably a few hundred bucks a person minimum. Uh, and, and let's get all these people in the room because high-level people want to be with high-level people, right? The, the, more, uh, the more money you make, the more valuable networking is versus the less money you make, the more valuable knowledge is, right? So on the lower end of the spectrum in revenue, you want more knowledge. On the higher end of the spectrum, you've acquired a lot of knowledge. The only way to get more knowledge that's good for you is by meeting other high-level people who are on the same page, right? If you make a million dollars a month, it's very hard to go to an event and get value from people who are making 200 grand a month. But if I'm sitting at a dinner for three or four hours connecting with other people doing a million dollars a month, I can learn a lot from that, right? So that's what's valuable for these people, and I started noticing that. So uh, we started doing this, and what we did was we went to cities, and we would have you know two or three clients in that city. I'll give you an example, Miami. We did a, we did a dinner in Miami. It cost us about seven and a half, eight grand. There was only like 10 people at the dinner. Uh, two of them were clients, seven of them were prospects. Uh, all of them doing multiple six figures or seven figures a month. I put them all in a room together. Most of these people have never met. They're all making new connections. They're like, wow, Eddie put us together. He's doing a million a month. He's doing a million a month. Wow, wow, wow. Boom, boom, boom. Before you know it, all of a sudden, most of that room is now our clientele, right? Because they're networking with our clients who are super happy. They have a great experience. And now they're associating the experience and the network that they're having with bad marketing as a whole. And now they're coming back. And the ones that didn't work with us actually all sent us referrals at some point in the last six months. So our strategy now is like, we don't need a million people to talk to. If I can just talk to like the best 10 in a room and I can get three of them to eventually work with us, I've done our part, right? And if you think about it, for these guys, average retainer was 20K a month plus 30% of net profit and I only spent seven grand on the dinner. So uh, do the math there. This is, uh, this is super big and this is probably the easiest for you guys to implement, right? If you're going into a city and you're working with uh, dentists, it's very easy for you to figure out who are the top dentists in the space and say, I'm hosting a dinner. One, two, three people are showing up. All you have to do is just leverage the other people, right? So if you can get one person to say yes and say there's other high-level dentists who are doing this who plan on attending, and that person says yes, you can take that information. Bailey's coming to my dinner. Hey, guys, yeah, a lot of big players like Bailey are coming to my dinner as well. All of them are going to be doing this much revenue. You want to come? Yes, great. Zach, you're in? Great. Hey, uh, person number three, Jared. Uh, Zach and Bailey are coming over to this dinner as well. Uh, a bunch of other heavy hitters. Are you down too? Yes, you are. Great. Jared's down. Now I take his name and go to the next person. And over time, you just leverage all the other people in the room. All these guys just want to be in the room together, but everyone's too lazy to actually plan something, right? So if you do all the planning for them, you can leverage other people that are in the room, and all of a sudden, now you have the richest room, sitting in dinner, eating on your behalf, uh, and you put these people together. So do not underestimate the strategy. We're going to do like 12 to 15 of these a year. We're going to come out of pocket for all of them. We don't care. We know at the end of the year, this ROI is going to be huge. So uh, the higher ticket you have, guys, the, the more valuable this is going to be for you. You're asking how to get the whales. The whales want to network with other whales. Put all the whales in a room. Build your own little aquarium, uh, and you'll be good to go. So um, uh, another thing we're doing is also two to three uh, what we call like piggyback events. This is like... This is like big shit. This is definitely the hardest one to achieve. Uh, that's why I left it to the end. Uh, we're spending about $120,000 to $200,000 uh, per event. So we just did one of these in Vegas as a test. Uh, and basically what we're doing is we're putting 250 to 400 people in a room. And uh, we're getting these people uh, into a room based on their revenue. So like you can only get in if you do $5 million a year or $3 million a year, whatever the case is, right? And we're vetting these people beforehand. And uh, again, we want bad to be a premium experience, right? So I'm not just like half-assing these events, we're dropping significant money. Ideally, uh, this is being covered by sponsors, and we're basically bringing the audiences with the sponsors. So uh, we just did one in Vegas. This was our first test run. We spent about $120,000. Uh, we got about $95,000 in sponsorships. Uh, we only came out 25 grand out of pocket. Uh, we've already signed more clients than 25 grand. We didn't pitch a single thing the entire event. We just threw a banger. We had a SIG DJ, open bar, Casino tables, Brian was there, let's go, big dog. Uh, Brian's still recovering. Um, and uh, it looks like this, just to kind of give you an idea. Like, this is high level shit, right? 
And this doesn't happen overnight, guys. I'm not telling you go and just spend 200 grand on an event. But if you are in the dental space, okay? I don't know why we're just stuck on dentist examples this whole time. <laughs> Gary was ruined. You're just getting free value over here, huh? If you're in the dental space and the biggest dental conference in America is happening in Vegas in March 15th, you better go and scrape every fucking dentist in the country and tell them you're throwing the biggest, baddest party of dentists who do X amount of money or more and you're putting them all in this room and sell the fuck out of that party for the next two months because everyone's gonna go to that dental event and you know what they're gonna do on the ground? We watched it happen. We went from 150 registrants to 400 in a day. We got 150 people to be like, I'm in for this party and they all showed up for the event and everyone's like, what are you doing tomorrow night? Oh, I'm going to the bad party. Bad party, what bad party? Oh, bro, you gotta register here. Boom, 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 all of a sudden, dude, one day, 250 people registered for the event, one day because we got 150 of them, the big dogs, to all commit to coming to this event. They showed up and everyone who asked anyone, what are you doing today, what are you doing tomorrow? Oh, I'm going to the bad event. I'm going to the bad event. What is this bad event? What is this bad event? All of a sudden, you have the leverage, right? That's why it's called a piggyback event. I don't need to spend millions of dollars to go and get all the best dentists into the same room when someone else has already spent 10 years building a reputation for their event. They've already spent millions of dollars. They're already paying the best speakers in the industry. They're already getting them all in a room for me. I just gotta be the coolest guy in the room. I gotta throw the best party. And the coolest part is, sponsors want that room. They want this room more than the conference room. If I have the top 400 guys out of a 2,500 person conference, that is the room people wanna sponsor. They don't care about everyone else. They can't have 2,500 conversations, but they can have 50 with high, high level people that are gonna be great clients for them. And so it's very easy to sell sponsorships to these kinds of events, right? So I went, I booked the venue, we, we, we made a 120 grand bet, and we're like, I promise I can go get some sponsors. We went and got some sponsors, and while we're getting sponsors, we're inviting people the whole time. We did this entire thing in two and a half weeks, we put it all together, uh, and it came out pretty sick. So moving forward, we're gonna be doing this more often. Uh, our next one we have our eyes set on is the Funnel Hacking Live uh, in Orlando. Uh, again, they're gonna put 6,000 people in a room for us. All these guys sell info products or e-com products. They've built reputation over the last 10 years in their software company in this event. And what am I gonna do? I'm just gonna go throw the sickest after party and everyone who's anyone will wanna come to that party, right? And over time, it'll only get easier. People, I guarantee, will start going to these events that are big and they'll say, is there a bad party happening? I wanna go to the bad party. Is there a bad party happening? And so this is a huge strategy uh, that we're implementing, again, I think you guys can do this still. You don't need to do it on this scale. But if you can get 50 of the best people in your industry in a room because they're attending another event, that is mega value for you. You don't need to pitch them. You just need to get them all in the same room and give them a premium experience. And they will appreciate that you are the person that put them in that room, that you are the person that's connected to the rest of these guys and provide that kind of value. Cool? Guys, guys. Cool? Yeah. There we go. Cool, now here's the problem. The problem is we can do all of this. I can do the ads, I can do the emails, I can pump revenue, I can sit here and you know, add $200,000 plus a month to the company. Uh, but the, the real problem is we can do all this, but how can we actually handle it, right? It's one thing to double from 100 to 200K a month, but we need much more than just sales to be able to handle an extra $2.4 million a month of revenue by the end of the year if I do this every month, right? It's not gonna be easy. It takes a few things. It takes being a better CEO, it takes having a better operation system. It, it takes having a tight company culture like Ashton and Gary have been talking about. It takes better client success processes. It takes better financial management. We can't just throw a $150,000 event if we don't have the money to front before I go and get the sponsorships. These things take planning. They take leadership and team structure. This entire event was not thrown by Ashton and I. It was thrown by our incredible team. We led the vision and they executed on it, you know what I mean? These are the people running the show behind the scenes. These are the people behind the cameras. These are the people setting up the stage. That is our team, okay? I can't afford to do that. I can't spend my time on that. I spend my time with you guys at this event, and they spend their time making sure this shit runs smooth. Has this been smooth so far? Nice. And sadly, no one is teaching this at the high level that's needed to run an eight-figure agency, right? In reality, it's people like the speakers who are doing it right, but the problem is, if you're speaking on a stage like this and you're doing eight figures a year, why would I go and spend my time investing into other people 
when I can just make way more money running my company, right? It doesn't make sense that I'm gonna go help you make and, and get paid less than I would just go to grow my own company that eventually I'm gonna exit. And that's why none of them sell any coaching. And it's also because no one told us what to do. So we had to lose millions of dollars from the mistakes that we made in our companies to get to where we're at. I mean, I mean millions of dollars. We've made some mistakes that have single-handedly cost us 300 grand plus in one single day, okay? These mistakes come with experience. They create that experience because no one teaches you how to be an actual CEO of an agency company. I'm not talking about 30 grand a month in your bedroom. Anyone can do that. That's a freelancer, right? That's a freelancer with some team members. But if you want to build a serious eight-figure company, one that can get a multiple like Brian Burt is getting on the stage, right? That takes operational experience. That takes being a better CEO. And the question is, how could someone even lead us to places that they've never been themselves? But it wasn't about us having a better business. It was actually about us just becoming better CEOs. We need to step up into that role, right? I, uh, I look back like three years ago, I thought I was a great leader, but I'm just sitting in a room in my, in my parents' house. And uh, we have a VA in the Philippines, uh, a team member in Lebanon. I'm like, you know, I'm a leader. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a $10 million a year company. I'm gonna have 100 team members. I can do this now. And I look back and I think like how naive I was to think that I knew what I needed to do in order to get to where we are here today. How many struggles we've been through, how much time we've invested into mentorship, all the things that it took to get to where we are. And just like Brian Bird said, I still don't know what the fuck I'm actually doing, right? And so that I will leave this open for Q and A. Just trying to get a little bit of value in dental today. Um, but so one thing I really like about kind of you and the way you presented your brand is the premium aspect of it. Um, but because I'm in dental, it's a little bit like, can you talk how you're translating that on the automotive side, on the local side, to be a premium brand? Like what has bad done kind of on the local side to be new, different, better? Yeah, so uh, what we used to do on the local side was uh, film selfie videos of ourselves in the office doing things and trying to create content that was easy to make like everyone else. Now we're going to automotive shops. We're filming really high level, sick content, right? We're, we're going and taking that premium content approach. So everyone else who's a shop owner is gonna go to our page and be like, damn, this is the level of shit that these guys are doing and automatically they're associating it with premium, right? So if you go to our automotive page, badmarketing.automotive, you're gonna see sick automotive content because that's what these guys wanna see, right? And that's what pulls viewership for, for the automotive space. And so if I can just focus on making the brand feel premium from the content we're posting organically, then it's enough for the automotive space, right? If I was to do something else, like next year, there's a huge automotive conference called SEMA in Vegas. I might go throw a ceramic coating after party only for people who do ceramic coatings and get 300, 400 of these guys in a room and throw another banger of a party, cover it with sponsors in the ceramic coating space, that's premium in itself, right? So I could do things like that once or twice a year, but on a regular basis, I need to be conscious of the content that I'm promoting what kind of quality am I putting out? I don't need to put out a million things, but if I can just put out good content that's high quality in the dental space, whether that's uh, you providing really sick information on things that dentists do, or shooting really sick content around dentists that you would normally run as ads, posting that kind of stuff on your page will give the effect of premium, right? Dentists are a little bit like lower um, marketing strategy level uh, than someone in the e-com space. So you have to do a lot less to impress them. You know what I mean? They're impressed by like a good TikTok video, you know? Whereas my people, like, they're like so crazy and analytical. If it's not like a freaking Super Bowl commercial, like they don't even care, you know what I mean? So you actually have it easier because of that. Yeah, great question, bro. Uh, any other questions? Hey, Eddie, good stuff. Um, quick questions, very genuine question. At what point did you guys decide, like, we want to get into, like, coaching and run a mastermind? Because from the time perspective, and, and I know you love helping people, but it seems like the revenue from, like, a year of running the mastermind is, like, may not be worth the time and stress for a lot of people. So, like, why is it worth it to you? Do you think running this event financially is an ROI? Yeah, just probably connections and just, like, being well-known in the industry. Yeah, we but. actually lose money on this event. And so like, 
why, why would I do this event if I was losing money on this event? And a lot of it is I want to be connected with other people who are like this in the space. And if no one else is going to go do it, I'm just going to go do it myself. And it came out of a place of necessity, right? These speakers up here, half of them you guys haven't even heard of. These guys are getting, you know, $100 million valuations on their companies, and they have 1,000 followers on their Instagram. None of you guys have heard about them, right? But how can I connect people like that with people like us, right? How can I selfishly get that knowledge for ourselves? How can I selfishly make a mastermind where most of the people in this group are doing six figures plus a month, and they're trying to get to seven figures plus in their business so that we can talk about the problems that we have and actually have solutions? I learn from this group just as much as everyone else is learning from this group. Every single person in this group has gone on a call and shared something that's transformed their entire company. And every time they do so, I get on the call. I get off the call with Ash and I'm like, dude, he just blew my brains out. Like, we need to implement this like ASAP in our business. This is sick, right? And so selfishly, there is no one else who's doing that. If I join any other agent, agency founder coaching group, with all due respect, I'm the biggest guy in the group. I'm the one getting asked for advice, right? Whereas how can I create a group where I can give everyone all the mistakes I've made, all the experience I have, give that to them on a silver platter, and in between giving that to them, we can all collaborate together on their problems, on my problems, whatever it is. Even I go in the group and I'll be like, hey, we're struggling with this. Does anyone have a process for this that's different than XYZ? Boom, 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 boom. Everyone in the group gives their opinion. They give honest answers. No one's gatekeeping anything. They'll just throw documents in there. Uh, and so selfishly, it was something that I wanted a community that high level for myself and for Ashton. Uh, and we knew that we could provide enough value in doing so as well. Sweet, thank you. Yep. Um, I have a question as far as uh, going talking about brand, because I know that's a big thing for you this year. How did you go about deciding what angle you want to take? Uh, sorry, one more time. For brand, how did you decide which angle of brand, like what you want bad to be? Like, how do you decide? Like, I want it to be edgy and you know, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's my company, right? So like, I'm like, if I'm gonna build this, I wanna, I wanna enjoy this, right? I want, to, I want it to be something I'm proud of. Um, and so like, for you guys in your real estate business, if you guys are like really witty and clever and funny. I would build your brand around really witty and clever and funny, right? I wouldn't try to be someone I'm not. And so I wanna be someone who's premium, who's, who's always giving, who's always collaborating, who's always like outwardly projecting energy towards other people and giving more than I'm receiving, right? And so the only way to do so is to present myself as a premium brand where I'm always doing it over. So whenever anyone buys anything from me, they're like, this guy over delivered 10X on whatever it is that they got. And so for me to do that, it has to be premium, right? The food that you guys have to eat has to be premium. The restaurants that we go to have to be premium. The stage setup has to be premium. And it reflects the same in our client success, right? We're not gonna do amazing for every client, but as long as we are setting a standard of doing premium level work, then that is what I want my company to be known as. I don't wanna be known as the dude who made the most money. I wanna be known as the dude who made the biggest impact and, and had that level of premium. You know, like, Eddie's selling something, it's gonna be a fucking ROI of ROIs and I'm signing up, you know what I mean? So that is how we, how we presented it for ourselves. What do we wanna be? We want bad to be that top shelf stuff uh, and we don't wanna sit here and service everyone in the world, you know what I mean? I just want the best of the best uh, and that's why we picked what we got. So you, I think you guys can reflect between both of you guys and then the, the third guy on your team uh, and, and kinda collaborate where do we feel like we wanna position ourselves like we were talking about yesterday, I think you need to identify like, what is that term for your brand uh, that you can use to leverage and say, this is us and this is kind of what we represent. And then in your ads and in your marketing and in your videography, uh, you guys can be you know, if witty if that's what you wanna be. If you wanna be super uptight and premium professional, you can be that. Uh, but pick whatever is native to you, because I promise you as you guys grow your businesses, the more you grow, the more you'll have to do content and all these other things to support it. And the more outside of your comfort zone and the box that you actually are as a person you are, the more uncomfortable you'll feel. And you'll get to a point where you say, I fucking hate this shit. I fucking hate filming videos because it's not me, right? But if you're just you, it's a lot easier to do. So I would, I would build around what you are and what you want to be. Cool? Yeah, I think that's good advice. Appreciate it. Great question. Any other questions? Yes. Eddie, you killed it, man. Thank um, you, what are some of the limiting beliefs that you've had to work through to go from a million dollars a year in top line to a million dollars a month in reoccurring revenue? Um, number one would be uh, that I can do it alone. 
Uh, I think like, uh, like Gary was talking about, I always like, I always thought like everything had to be done the way that I wanted it to be done. And in order to do it the way that I needed to, I had to do it myself or I had to be involved, right? And uh, I think I had to accept that it's okay if everything is 85% of what I want it to be. As long as we can grow and do that and I don't have to be attached to it, I'll take 85% zero time over 100% full time. You know what I mean? Sure. I think that was principle number one. Uh, and I think principle number two, I was telling this story yesterday. I forgot to who. Uh, I had a transformational moment in my life. Um, I was like super timid in high school. I, I was pretty much like, I, I mean, I was a funny guy and all this stuff. I had like self-confidence, but not really. I was always like a bench player in sports and wasn't like a cool kid or anything like that. And I was driving to university for the first time. My dad was driving me to drop me off. It was about an hour away. And I was like looking out the window and I like clicked in my head. I was like, you know, everyone that's known me up to this point were people who like went to middle school with me. And so like they established like their persona of who Eddie is. And then we went to high school together. And then like that's the persona that I had to keep because that's what everyone else thought of me. And I was like, as of today, all the people that I'm going to meet know nothing about me except what they know about me in this moment. So today I get to choose who do I want to be. Do I want to be the same guy that I've been? Or do I want to be a guy who gets whatever the fuck he wants in life? And so in that moment, I like, dude, it's crazy. I just had like my own, it's like hypnosis, dude. I was like, that's not who I want to be. This is who I want to be. I want to be, I want to be the guy that everyone wants to hang out with. I want to be the guy that brings energy and value to everyone around me. I, w I want to be different. You know, I want, to, I want to be able to pull people in a different way. And so like I made that commitment to myself. Day one, I did the most uncomfortable shit. I knocked on nine stories of dorm rooms. Knocked on every door, introduced myself. It was the most uncomfortable experience ever. I sat next to a new person every meal and every class for an entire semester. Like, it's super uncomfortable. A room of 500 people. A cafeteria, 10 times the size of this room, and there's one dude sitting there, and I go sit next to him. Like, they're like, what the fuck are you doing, right? I made myself uncomfortable because I knew that's the identity I wanted. And so it was a huge identity shift. And ever since then, dude, I've just, I know I can go get what I want. And if I want something, I know I can find a way to get it. And I tell people some stories about other companies I've started and things like that. And they're just like, how did you know? Like, how did you know to do that? You know what I mean? And the answer is I fucking didn't. You know what I mean? I just knew that this was the result I wanted to get. And so I had to find a way to try to see which one worked the best, right? And so a lot of it's just your own internal self-belief of thinking, dude, I'm not a guy who can do a million dollars a month. You know what I mean? I, I didn't even know I could do 100K a month. You know what I mean? Do you ever think that? Like, dude, fuck, at one point, I didn't even know I could do 100 grand a month, right? How, how am I going to do a, a million dollars a month, right? Yeah, and so yeah. I challenge you to shift your framework. Mm. And also, even if it's not me or Ashton, dude, get a mentor who's doing that kind of revenue uh, so that they can help you get to that point because that is the gap that you need. You can sit here and try to figure it out over the next three years. Or you just have someone give you the answers and figure it out in a year. You know what I mean? So even if it's not me or Ashton, I really challenge you to get a mentorship, get into a group of high level people who are playing in that space and you'll accelerate that growth. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? What's up, homie? Great what speech. Up? Thank you. Um, you know, on the topic of branding, et cetera, can you walk us through, you know, how you guys thought about transitioning to bad and what would be, like, what's the importance of that of, you know, everyone's ex media, et cetera, and bringing that you know, professionalism that you guys are aiming for and like that super high quality vibe. Love it. So uh, you guys want to know how we came up with the name bad? No, you don't. Hell yeah. All right, all right. It's a pretty cool story, actually. I haven't shared this publicly. So, uh, so uh, prior to uh, conversations with Ashton about the merger, uh, we had the name 4Media, right? You can sit down, by the way. It's going to be a story. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we had the name 4Media. And uh, there's a company in, in the UK called 4Media Group, OK? And uh, Four Media Group happened to exist one month before us as a company in the United States. Uh, and we had you know, hundreds of thousands of impressions, millions of impressions a month, whatever it is. They were like non-existent, right? And so over time, people who thought they were our clients were going to apply to them. And people who thought they were applying to work with our Four Media applied with them. And then when they got to the final stages of signing up, they'd realize that it wasn't the same Four Media. And then they'd dip and come back to us. And so it started pissing them off. And uh, so they sent me uh, basically like uh, an attempt for like to, re to collect money on behalf of damages. They said, we've been around longer than you. Even though you own the trademark, we have a first use is what it's called. 
uh, a month before you guys. And because of that, we can technically take the name. Uh, so we'll let you guys, uh, we'll, we're asking you guys to remove the name and pay us $500,000. And I was like, <laughs> all right, come at me. You're getting zero, was my response. Uh, and so I, I was smart enough and aware enough to recognize that this was a problem I didn't really want to deal with. And I had a brand bigger than Form Media at the time, right? So I didn't really need to be attached to the name as long as we still had Eddie Malouf at the time, right? We didn't have Ashton. Ashton had Heeman. And so in the process of doing so, we started behind the scenes trying to figure out what could we change our name to, a name to that would be like big. Like we have a shot to reset. We have the results. We have the team. Uh, we don't need to sit here and do something inside of a box. We could play different because we have the results to speak. And so um, we spent months as a team in the boardroom. I mean, dude, we came up with thousands of names. I mean, Chad, GPT, as much as you can possibly imagine, you know? And the problem is every, every name sounded like a software company or your typical agency that you just, you know, you start in a bedroom, right? And um, back to first use, every name that was like good, we'd go look it up and there's like 10 companies with the same name and they're all a bunch of Joe Schmoes in their bedrooms who probably never did a dollar of revenue, but they have first use. And if I got back into the same scenario, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to end up in the same spot. Uh, and we're sitting there and uh, we're mapping out what do we want to represent? And we're like, we want to be premium. Uh, we don't want to go after small guys. We want to go after big guys. We want to be a proposal on a table. If Nike has five folders, we want to be one that one of those five uh, and allow us to be able to have a shot at that contract. Uh, so we started listing what do we want to do. And um, I think it was Julian. Was it Julian? Does anyone know? It was Julian, our CFO, literally the, the worst marketer in the entire company. <laughs> I, I shit you not, like doesn't have an ounce of a brain cell of marketing. And, sorry, Julian, but hey, financial king over there. And uh, he goes, what do we call it bad marketing? And, and, and everyone in the room's like, ha, 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 that would be so stupid. <laughs> and I was like, pause. That's fucking good. So we, we started doing research. We found out like no one has used bad marketing since 2020. Then we got on the whiteboard and we started picking like BAD, like what could it stand for? Uh, and we started thinking like we could take the angle like liquid death, right? Liquid death is water. They went with liquid death, total opposite polarizing. But because it was so polarizing, it got so much attention that it boomed, right? And so we're like, back to the Nike thing, if there's five folders on Nike's desk as finalists for a bid on a project, and bad marketing is one of them, I would bet that they're opening that folder first. And so we're like, that's sharp. But we didn't have the domain, uh, someone else owned it, we didn't have the handles, someone else owned it. Uh, so we went on this like private mission behind the scenes to do so. Uh, before we committed to the name, I reached out to Ashton, and I said, hey bro, we're changing our name. I, I probably will never want to change it again, and so why don't we, why don't we, this idea that we flirted for for two years, why don't we explore it right now? Because now is the best time for us to change a name. And if we're changing a name, we could merge and change the name together, and I could take this from a $500,000 lawsuit request to a rebrand and merger and huge PR, and we can turn this from the worst news in company history to the best news in company history. And that's that creative thing that Ashton was talking about. How can I turn this problem that looks so devastating behind the scenes that I'm dealing with privately, no one knows about, I'm back and forth attorney to attorney. This guy's a prick, won't even like respond to my DMs, talking through his attorney. He literally said, his attorney was stupid enough to say, uh, my client saw that you have a blue Lambo and he's coming for you for as much money as he can get. You know what I mean? So I'm like dealing with this behind the scenes, I'm like how can we flip the script? And so I reached out to Ash and I said, dude, we've always flirted with this idea. We're trying to build something bigger. We're always collaborating on these projects. We do agency founders together. We know our teams can work. So why are we pushing this down the road? I don't think I'm gonna change the name again. If you agree to this name and you're down to take this path and this level, let's build the mission statement together. Let's do the core values together. Let's rebuild what this company needs to represent with this new name and let's launch it and do something out of the box and play just a bigger game and just, just do it different. We don't wanna play inside of this box of rules that everyone else has given us. Are you down? It took a few months of conversation, it took from April to about July. July we confirmed it's happening. July, August, September, we worked tirelessly behind the scenes, teams merging behind the scenes, doing everything we could. October 1st we announced it uh, and that's 
why it's called bad marketing. I think we did a pretty good job, yeah? Wait, wait, wait. Give, give him that mic. Give me, give me an AFA testimonial, bro, for that story. Come on. Yeah, that was dope, man. Um, yeah, so like you said, uh, we joined AFA last year. I was probably doing like 70, 80K a month. Not only did we make probably our best hires in the business history, but we doubled top line revenue and uh, have a hell of a lot more cash in the bank. You're at what, 200K a month right yeah, now? Yeah, 200K. 200K a month, 70K a month to 200K a month, best hires, and now you're building an entire email department. Hell yeah. Fucking proud of you, bro. Thank you. Good shit. <laughs> Any other questions? You guys are hungry, huh? You guys ready to go to lunch? Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate you.